Good evening and welcome to A Faith That Works. Last week, if you'll remember, we were looking at the passages that involved the um, uh, heavenly view of, that John had. And um, this week we are just continuing from that as we look at the seven seals, the uh, opening of the seven seals. Last week we um, saw that there were those that um, had tried to consider opening those seals, the heavenly um, uh, entities, and, and only one was able to open the seal, and that was Jesus the Christ. Um, so as we continue this week, we're going to look at those seals. And um, first off, I'll have to say that only six of the seals were opened initially together. There was um, a break, and then uh, if you'll look over in the eighth chapter, you'll see that the seventh and final seal was opened. But not until then do we see all seven of the seals being opened. So as we mentioned earlier, Christ's revelation to John was basically a book of, of warning of things to come and an encouragement to believers to stand strong in the face of those things that were to eventually come. And these things that were coming were events and uh, happenings that were detrimental to the Christian believer. So uh, uh, he warned his followers that the unbelieving world would persecute them and might even kill them because of their commitment to him. So um, if we were to look in Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, um, Matthew said, Look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as harmless as doves. Now, this is Jesus talking to and Matthew uh, writing it down. Because people will hand you over to Sanhedrins and flog you in their synagogues. Beware of them. And um, also in that same chapter, verses 21 and 22, uh, he goes on to say, Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will even rise up against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be delivered. In that same passage, in verse 22, the first part of it, Christ tells his followers, but the one who endures to the end will be delivered. Um, this is a promise of Christ, not only his promise, but God's promise to believers that if they will stand true in their faith, in their commitment to Christ, that they will be delivered in the end. Christ will not abandon his followers. Look at what Jesus has to say as he gives the great commission to his followers in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. Now, in verse 19, um, the proper reading of that really should be, as you go, therefore, make disciples of all nations as you go. In other words, we're to have a lifestyle of telling people by our lives, by word of mouth, by sharing of the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord. <clears throat> Christians in John's day needed encouragement. 
they needed assurance that what they had heard, what the gospel said was really true and that Christ would keep his promise. Uh, they saw him die on the cross and they had to wonder, is this the end? Uh, th is this all that there is to be? But Christ had promised them that he would come back that he would receive them unto himself, unto his own. And so you can imagine in days of trial when the church was young, this is early church, this is the first century church, they were already being persecuted because of their commitment to this Christ, this Jesus who... Uh, the soldiers had placed there on the cross, nailed his hands and feet to the uh, cross and um, stuck a spear in his side. And, um, you know, he, he died there on that cross. And they had to say, is, is this all there is to what he had to say? But on the third day, on, on um, Sunday morning, as we know it today, he arose from the dead to... Um, reign forever and ever eternally with God. And so the Christians in that first century needed the assurance that their God, their heavenly Father, their Christ was going to uh, make sure of what he had promised them. The book of Revelation contains passages that stress God's providence for his people in every situation, for every need, both on earth and in heaven. Uh, God is a God of providing, a provision. Uh, it's called providence. And uh, God promises to be faithful to us, so we should be faithful to God and Christ, regardless of what happens and whatever the cost we might pay for our faithfulness to him. In this session, we will study the breaking of the seven seals, and this will be found in initially in chapter 6, verses 1 through 17. Uh, we're going to take a short break right now, and then we'll return as we look at a little bit of background to uh, this part of the vision that John received uh, concerning the opening or breaking of the seals. So come back. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. It's Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached, and you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida, has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships transform your world the only way we come to know the saviorship of jesus christ is by bowing and acknowledging that he is lord and king over all the earth jesus christ died on a cross paid the penalty for our sin and by repenting of our sin and accepting him by faith what he did for us we are forgiven salvation is not a combination of faith and works salvation is by faith alone in God. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. 
Welcome back. And as we look at the background uh, concerning the seven seals, uh, we go back to uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Um, the passage uh, continues with the vision of John. Uh, John had, had seen the throne in, in his vision, um, in a throne in heaven with four living creatures and 24 elders around the throne, praising and worshiping God, uh, singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Then we saw the scroll that was sealed with the seven seals taken out of God's hand by the only one worthy to open it, the Lamb, which is Christ Jesus. And this section shows the message of the seven sealed um, scroll to be the events of history under the sovereignty of Christ. Both divine sovereignty and human freedom are real. Yet, when the final curtain has been drawn on uh, history, we can be certain that God's purpose will have been accomplished. God's will uh, should be acknowledged in a threefold perspective. Um, number one, the first part of it is his intentional will. God intends for certain things to happen. He intends for um, believers and followers to act in a way that uh, um, shows their allegiance, their commitment to who they profess to be their Savior and Lord. Um, his intentional will is his will that has certain um, uh, proponents uh, that he has intended specifically. Then his permissive will, secondly, is that will or that part of his will which permits things to happen. He set the world into motion. He created mankind. He gave mankind a free will to choose uh, good or bad, uh, a, a will of our own. And many times we can through our will, our humanly, uh, human will, we can um, talk to God and, and uh, He will permit certain things to be, to come about. And so He has a permissive perspective of His will then his ultimate will is that in the end, when, as we said a moment ago, that final curtain is drawn down on human history, his ultimate will, what he has willed for this earth, will be accomplished ultimately, in the end, finally. So here you see a threefold perspective of God's will, his intentional will, what he plans for mankind, he intends for us, his permissive will, what he allows to take place, and then his ultimate will, which is uh, what finally is accomplished according to his um, uh, will for mankind, for his creation. Since the scroll in the Lamb's hand concerned history, the question is what aspect of history was intended? Talking about his, his intentional will, his intended 
will. So what part of history or what aspect of history was under his intentional will? One of the many questions we might ask about the seals then is when do the judgments of the seals occur? Did John understand them to be in his time or in the distant future? Well, we've debated that over the years, over the centuries of when God's will would be ultimate, when that final curtain will be drawn, uh, when these judgments will become real um, in, as far as enacted. Um, some Bible interpreters generally believe John described events that happened throughout history. Um, as we see the uh, seals opened and the events that uh, John describes to take place, uh, some believe that these things happen throughout the history of our um, um, knowledge of, of Jesus Christ, uh, beginning with the uh, uh, birth and ministry of Christ throughout history up into the present. They believe that these events and happenings have been taking place within this history. Others see the breaking of the seals as trends leading up to the end time. Still, other Bible students think the seal judgments occur either in the first or second half of the seven-year tribulation immediately before Christ returns. Now, they're probably... Um, more believing of this uh, last concept in our world today uh, than the others. But nevertheless, um, we see that John's vision was real for that day and time, it has been real for all of those throughout history who have studied God's Word, and they continue to be real for us today. Now, let's look at the seals. Uh, the breaking of the first seal by the Lamb reveals a rider on a white horse who goes out to conquer and the rider wears a crown and has a bow in his hand. In the Old Testament, the bow is a sign of military might. And thus, the rider of the white horse seems to represent military conquest, which God uses throughout history to accomplish his purpose. Here, the symbolism of white is limited to the idea of conquest as it's described in the opening of this seal. Some believe that um, the rider of this white horse is Christ. Well, Christ didn't use a bow to uh, uh, conquer evil. Some believe that this simply refers to the con uh, conquest or the military uh, event uh, which captures those who are unbelievers, uh, con uh, conquering those who have not uh, believed in Christ and those who are um, we call antichrists, those fighting against Christ. Um, the symbolism here is limited to the idea of conquest as it appears in the scripture here. And I think we have to uh, um, believe that that is the case 
that Christ uh, has not been one to wield a, a bow in his hand to conquer his enemies. Now, there is a second seal. And that second seal, as it's opened, John sees a red horse. And there's pretty much a unanimous agreement that the red horse is symbolic of war. And despite the similarity of the interpretation of the red horse uh, over against the white horse, um, both of those having similarities as far as conquering and, and military might, the white horse, the rider and the white horse are conquerors. The rider and the red horse are symbolic of bloodshed and war, which uh, necessarily, most of the time, accompany the conquest. Uh, the rider of the red horse was given a great sword, symbolizing a great slaughter. And um, as we look at the account of the last half of the tribulation, we see that during this time, there will be uh, great uprisings and uh, there will be much bloodshed. The um, Christians will be persecuted, not only persecuted, but they will be uh, beheaded and uh, slaughtered. <clears throat> Although God does not inspire the evil that promotes war, in his sovereignty, he uses war to accomplish his will. We, we see that in the Old Testament as God would send the Israelites into a pagan land and tell them to conquer that land. And um, at several points, he told them not to leave anyone alive. Not man, woman, child, or even animals of that pagan society so God uses his uh, sovereignty to accomplish his will even though it might be through war then we see a third seal being opened and as that seal is opened a black horse and its rider appears and the black horse depicts the scarcity the famine, uh, inflated prices that accompany war. Um, most of us uh, can't remember the earlier wars that our nation has in, been involved in, but um, we've heard the stories told of how um, there was a Great Depression following World War I in the late 20 20s and early 30s in which uh, people lost everything they had. Um, money was almost non-existent. Uh, food was rationed. Uh, gas was rationed if you could get any. And uh, this was just a part of the consequences of wartime. In the first century, a denarius was a day's wage for common labor, and a quart of wheat was the daily ration for a Roman soldier. Thus, prices were so high that an entire day's labor was required for daily sustenance of one person. Now, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, the expression, do not harm the oil and the wine, uh, may represent the sarcastic attitude of the conquerors showing that oil and wine were available but that the poor couldn't afford it. They were more or less mocking those who could not afford uh, the finer things of life, um, the oil and the wine. Um, 
And these were not extravagant things. These were needed for the daily necessities of life, of maintaining the body. So, the black horse represents or depicts the scarcity, famine, and inflated prices of food and other essential products uh, that accompany war. Then the fourth seal is opened. And out of that seal comes the pale horse and its rider. There's no question about the meaning of the pale horse because it's there in the scripture. As stated, the rider's name was Death and Hades followed him. If you'll remember uh, in earlier studies, we talked about the meaning of the word Hades or uh, the Hebrew uh, was Sheol, which basically meant the same thing. And that was simply the realm of the dead. Uh, it could have referred to the grave, but it was the realm of the dead, the death. Um, it means the unseen spirit world, the realm of the dead, the grave. And the phrase following that, and they were given power over a fourth of the earth, may refer exclusively to death and Hades. But the additional words, to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth, seem to include, include the first three horses and their riders. Um, a fourth of the earth indicates a pretty sizable amount. And this was uh, referring to people. Eventually, uh, the reference to destruction by wild beasts may refer to those who died in the Roman arenas in that first century. Uh, if you'll remember uh, reading your uh, world history, you know that uh, the Christians were, um, as they said, fed to the lions. They were cast into uh, the arena with lions and, you know, it's fight or be eaten. And um, most of the time it was fight and be eaten because they um, were just thrown into the arena and um, there was no um, taking them out until they were dead. And we also see the uh, side of the gladiators fighting there in that Roman arena as uh, it was a sport for the um, royalty and the rich to watch the um, Roman soldiers uh, fight the gladiators and, and the Christians and... Um, so this could be a reference uh, to that type of destruction. Eventually, the Roman Empire, which lived by conquest, would fall by conquest. Um, Jesus said to Peter in Matthew twenty six fifty two, Put your sword back in its place, because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. And if you remember the context of that, uh, when the soldiers came to take Jesus and arrest him, Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of the slave of uh, uh, one of the uh, officials. And Jesus told him to put his sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And, uh, and um, paraphrasing there. Then there was a fifth seal. And this fifth seal 
had to do with the martyrs. A martyr is one that gives his life for what he believes. Uh, over the centuries, there have always been those who have been put to death because of their commitment to Jesus Christ, who refuse to recant the, their uh, commitment to Jesus. And uh, the first four seals related assumingly to militarism in general and, and the Roman militarism in particular, which boomeranged on Rome in terms of judgment. In this context, the fifth seal gives the main reason for divine retribution against Rome, the blood of the martyrs. Accordingly, John saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. These are those believers who had uh, been um, hung on a cross uh, as Jesus was, who had been beheaded or had been fed to the beasts, the lions, because of their commitment to Jesus Christ and because they refused to rec recant their commitment. Uh, the mortars then ask God how long he will hold back from judging and avenging their blood. Then we see that uh, they receive white robes and are told to rest a little longer until the number of martyrs is complete. Well, we see in our world today people dying all around the earth, all around the world, because they will not renounce Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. We hear it on the news almost daily. And we see that uh, those who refuse to renounce Christ in favor of Islam uh, are being killed right and left. There are more martyrs in this past century than there have been from the beginning of the 1900s all the way back to Jesus Christ. That's a lot of people. All because they had faith to stand up for what they believed, refused to give up their commitment to Christ. They receive white robes and are told to rest a little longer until the number of martyrs is complete. The color white here symbolizes the martyr's purity. They have remained true. They have remained faithful. And so they were given white robes symbolizing their purity. Many theologians believe the fifth seal symbolizes assurance for the faithful of all ages and that God will judge evil. God will judge evil, but in his own time. Now, the last seal that we're going to talk about tonight is the sixth seal. If you'll remember at the beginning of the program, I told you that there are seven seals, but that the last seal was not opened immediately after the sixth there was a parenthesis in history as we see other things described and uh, depicted. And then on over in chapter 8, we see that the seventh seal, the last seal, is opened. So we're going to look at the sixth seal um, of which most interpreters see that the events of this sixth seal as having to do with end times 
um, this is uh, apocalyptic language that it's uh, using here in a terrifying description painted in vivid apocalyptic terms. The opening of the sixth, seals, sixth seal reveals the terror of the wicked. Listen to that. The terror of the wicked. Those who have refused to um, receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those who continue to act as antichrists against Christ, against His gospel. Those who um, make sin their lifestyle without repentance. Those who continue to persecute Christians, the Christ's church. They will call upon the mountains, it says in the scripture here. The rocks to fall upon them, to hide them from the wrath of God. Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10 verses 30 through 31 states, For we know the one who has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. Now, we often refer to being in the hands of God, but to fall into the hands of the living God as a, an unrepentant sinner in these last days should be terrifying to all who are in that position. Uh, to reject God's love eventually means to receive His wrath. God's continuing opposition to sin. The judgment depicted here seems to be the picture of the final judgment. Uh, as we talked about uh, the different degrees of, of punishment and the different degrees of war uh, reward. We talked about the fact that uh, death is not the final resting place. The sinner as well as the believer dies and goes to a place that is intermediary between death, earth, and heaven, eternal life. The sinner goes, those unrepentant sinners go to a place that they receive their uh, punishment, but it's not the final punishment. Christians, believers, go to that intermediary place we call, or Jesus called, paradise. Uh, so when uh, we're absent from the body, we're present with God, with Christ. And as he told the thief to, who died with him beside him there on the cross, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, paradise is not that final resting place. But when Christ comes, returns, and the bodies are raised from the earth, believers will be given a new body, a heavenly body, and they will stand before God and be judged according to their works. Now, you can't work your way to heaven. Don't get that wrong understanding. Only by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and 
No one comes to the Father but by me. Those who have given their lives, their souls, their hearts to Christ and ask Him to come in and to their life and be Savior and Lord will stand before Him and receive rewards. They will be judged according to their deeds accordingly. On the other hand, those, those who died or left this earth without repenting of their sins, without accepting the grace, the salvation that Jesus Christ uh, died to give them, they will stand in judgment before what is called the great white throne. Now, at that point, there's no turning back. They can't say, oh, God, I'm sorry. I, I didn't understand. I, I really would like to go ahead and accept your salvation now before uh, it's too late. Well, it's too late when they stand behind, in front of that throne, the great white throne, because they will be judged according to their evil deeds. Just as there are different levels of rewards in heaven, there are different levels of punishment in hell, the Bible tells us. And they will be judged accordingly. But all of those who are unbelievers, those who have rejected Christ, will be cast into that bottomless pit, the lake of fire, as Revelation calls it. They will be separated from God eternally in a burning fire that never consumes the body. In other words, it's eternal pain and suffering and agony. There will be a great chasm, a divide between heaven and hell. None can cross over from either direction. Judgment depicted here in this sixth seal will be final judgment. Now, at this point, there's a parenthesis, as I said a moment ago, in the opening of the seals. And the opening of the sixth seal does not occur, in, or the seventh seal does not occur until after, or until chapter 8. And at this juncture, uh, we will insert a parenthesis until next week in our studies. And um, we will pick up with the Revelation parentheses in chapter 8 um, next week as we continue starting... Uh, with chapter 7 actually leading up to the opening of that seventh seal. Until then, I hope you will read back through material that we've already studied. Uh, look back at what we studied tonight. Don't take what I say face value. Open your Bibles. See what the Word actually says. Um, God will open your eyes as the Holy Spirit dwells within your heart and life. Um, God works through the Holy Spirit to help you understand His Word. And so I hope you will go back and, and look at uh, what we've studied already in the book of Revelation up to where we are tonight. And, and go ahead and, and look at uh, chapters 7 and 8 as we get ready to study through that next week. Until then, I hope you have a great week. May God bless you who bless Him. In Christ's name I pray this. I'll see you next week. Good night.